We're going to get started. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Uh, we're here to talk about the non-military components of the United States strategy in Afghanistan. I think the first thing you have to say is uh, I certainly welcome, uh, I think many people welcome the fact that President Trump and the Trump administration has come forward with a, uh, a new strategy uh, for Afghanistan without timelines and redoubling down on the commitment to a great cause. I think the fact that there are three million girls in school and there's a whole lot at stake in Afghanistan, not just our security, but there's a, a moral component to this as well. So I think that, uh, uh, and there's a lot of progress. I think that that doesn't get a lot of uh, coverage on this. And so for us to risk um, letting all of that go uh, would have been, the price is way too high. We've been working on this for a long time here at CSIS. It's been a privilege to work with my friend, Ambassador Wayne, uh, who is the former uh, coordinator for assistance in Afghanistan among, and he's a senior advisor here at CSIS. And we've done a number of things with Ambassador Wayne. Um, so we've got a very good panel to cover the issues today. But I think the other point I want to make is the, you can't solve the challenges of Afghanistan without diplomacy and without development. And that I, we certainly welcome the fact that there is a security, we requires a security component, but the facts on the ground are being changed by diplomacy and development and the private sector. And so we want to have that part of the conversation. And the other thing is, we want to work ourselves out of a job. That Afghanistan's in a different place than 10 or 15 years ago. If you look at the size, the amount of assistance as a, as a size of the GNP of the economy of Afghanistan, it's much smaller than 10 years ago. And if you look at Afghanistan, Afghanistan is collecting taxes, something north of 10% of its GNP collected in taxes. That means for every dollar they're collecting in taxes from, the, from a formal private sector, that's one less dollar of foreign assistance to pay for schools and hospitals, pay for security. So we want to see those numbers go up. We want to see tax collections go up. We want to see economic growth happen and we want to work ourselves out of a job or, or work ourselves to a smaller part of the job. Let's put it that way. So I think, and I think that is possible and we need to have a, an end point and, and to have a vision for what that looks like. And so I think the non-military side is critical to this and, and that's going to be a critical part of this. I'm really pleased uh, my good friend and colleague Romina Vandura is going to be moderating this discussion. She's a new senior fellow here. She comes from the Economist Intelligent Unit, and um, you have her bio, uh, but it's a real privilege to have her with us. I'm very grateful that she's going to be moderating this. I'm going to introduce um, uh, Abdul Nafai Sana, who is the political counselor of the Embassy of Afghanistan, to give an Afghan perspective on this, and he's going to make a few brief remarks, and then we're going to turn the panel over um, to my friend Romina Vandura. Um, Abdul, please come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for the invitation and arranging this timely and important discussion. Ambassador Olson, Ambassador Wine, Mr. Gast, Mr. Grieco, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Uh, the Afghan strategy announced by the President of the United States on July 21st is an important milestone. We welcome the shift to a condition-based strategy, which means that the determination of the presence and number of troops will depend on the ground realities in Afghanistan. While we welcome this announcement, the government of Afghanistan is aggressively pursuing its agenda of reforms, self-reliance, anti-corruption measures, and peace and reconciliation efforts. We believe in the fact that military is not the only solution to the Afghan problem. Economic development, good governance, reforms, tackling corruption, eradication of narcotics, peace and reconciliation, and regional cooperation are vital steps towards achieving lasting stability. The government of Afghanistan is committed to reforms and addressing its internal challenges. We just signed our commitment to implementing a compact with the United States, which is aimed at prioritizing the existing commitment of the government of Afghanistan and measuring achievements against a set of benchmarks in a number of core areas. Representatives of the two countries will meet regularly to ascertain whether the benchmarks are met according to the established, time, established timelines. The compact will cover four critical areas, including economy, security, good governance, and peace and reconciliation. Significant reforms in areas of business, climate, financial sector, 
and primary sector are underway. We are also committed to providing the necessary hard infrastructure for trade and investment to take place, including primarily power, transport, and telecoms. Afghanistan is pursuing its self-reliance agenda with absolute determination and is committed to improving government services and effectiveness, rule of law, and control of corruption. In regards to peace and reconciliation, Afghanistan is trying to promote bilateral, trilateral, and multilateral mechanisms for regional cooperation. The Kabul process is an important platform in this direction. Our national peace strategy calls for a proactive outreach in support of peace and reconciliation. We believe that with the proper support of the international community, we will have significant progress in these areas. I would like to end on the note that Afghanistan is moving forward and the people of Afghanistan are committed to owning their future. I just had to make it short because I was told that I have only four minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to, uh, I'm going to introduce the distinguished panel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Romina Banduria, a senior fellow at CSIS. And I'm joined by Ambassador Tony Wayne. He's the former Deputy Ambassador and Coordinating Director for Development and Economic Affairs for the US Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. Also, um, Mr. Earl Gast, he's the former mission, mission director of Afghanistan for um, USAID. Um, ambassador Richard Olson, um, former um, US ambassador to Pakistan and special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And Mr. Je Jeffrey Grieco, uh, president and CEO of the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce. Um, so I'm going to begin um, asking two questions about the, the past. Um, and so one of the, the main uh, issues is, what's, what's different uh, in Afghanistan since September 11th? Um, the second question, uh, I'm an economist, I like data. Um, so the second question to the panelists would be, what are some key um, achievements, some key data points that, that you could talk about um, since you know September 11th, that that have been a success, um, and that we can show uh, p progress in Afghanistan. So those those are two questions about the past, and then I'll ask two questions about the future strategy and about the future of Afghanistan. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I think. Uh, as a former assistant administrator at USAID, I think the investments we made early on uh, from 2002 onward were focused on building the social infrastructure of Afghanistan, which was completely decimated. So we focused on building schools, getting curriculum designed, getting girls in school, uh, building clinics, local community-based clinics, establishing midwife systems, and all of that early infrastructure investment took Afghanistan. Uh, maternal death rates went from, I think, 189 out of 211 up to where it is now, which is, I think, about 110. And, and that's dramatic progress mm -hmm. for a country to make in such a short time period. It usually takes 30 years to see that kind of effect. Schools, we have, I think, 80% of the girls now in schools. It's taken a little bit of a fallback the last six, five, six or seven years. Um, there are more schools built, uh, perhaps too many schools in some cases, because conflict zones overtook the schools that we had constructed uh, with the Afghan community. So I think education, and social progress in healthcare has taken dramatic steps forward. Other steps, economic steps, are really important to know. Uh, they've acceded to the WTO, and they're working very hard to comply with all the accession requirements that a typical state has to do. And with very little uh, capacity in their own ministries to do that, it's been hard, but they're working through it very diligently with great support from the donor community. Their revenue collections in the last few years now have started to tick up. So domestic resource mobilization is now improving. I think that's a very big credit to President Ghani because he's the one who's really focused on trying to improve the domestic resource mobilization. Their fiscal state is okay, but I qualify that because the IMF is in a workout with Afghanistan. And so 
their fiscal state better be okay if we're in a workout situation. Um, uh, Sub-regional growth, so both within Afghanistan, there are big pockets of very strong private sector-led, market-led growth going on. Herat, Jalalabad, Mazar, other areas that I think is a real model. Kabul, I don't like to throw in there as an automatic because Kabul is itself the center of government and so there's naturally more, I think, investment and, and trade going on with institutions there. Uh, the president is moving now aggressively to integrate the country into the regional economy. There's a whole bunch of announcements that they've made. They now have a direct rail service from China coming into northern Afghanistan. There is now direct flights, cargo flights happening now every three weeks between Kabul into India. That's a new agreement that the president had signed. That's positive, and it's in, I, I, from hearing from the government officials, it's actually going to be speeding up, and you'll see more of that. And last is road integration. There's a lot of roads being built, and the Chabahar port deal in the south, which is going to give them access uh, into a, 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 a free port area for exports, I think is also critical. Last is ICT, I think is a very positive thing. It's taken too long for the president and the government to move forward on liberalizing the ICT industry sector. That means they're gonna have a spectrum allocation for 4G, uh, finally. Uh, it should have happened probably two years ago and there's been a lot of resistance to it. He did announce an open access policy which got put up on the website finally the last month or so. So you'll see now big investments coming in in telecom sector which early on in Afghanistan, with the help of, frankly, of the U.S. Department of Defense, who helped to go in and build a lot of that infrastructure, that was a driver of a lot of the private sector growth early on. And now it's uh, shifting to a private sector-led effort without any USG and uh, involvement in it. Great, thank you. And, and Jeff, uh, I won't repeat uh, the accomplishments that, that you've cited. And, and let me say, yes, it's, the U.S. government was the main uh, donor during that time, but it was also uh, if you will, a consortium of donors um, from all, all over the world contributing to the foundational uh, investments, if you will, in, in Afghanistan at an early stage. Um, most people use 2002 as the reference point, and so we see a lot of progress. We've seen a lot of progress from 2002, probably until the time that I served with Ambassador Wayne in Afghanistan. I was there f during the surge from 2010 to 2011. But I would also say that since that point, progress has been uh, more incremental, if you will, slower, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so even though um, there are a lot of good things to cite, as Jeff has done, w with regard to education, with regard to health, with regard to the economy, I, th I think the, the, the point uh, that we, the major crisis that we were looking at uh, during a period of 2010, 2011, was the actual transition and the effect that the transition would have uh, on Afghanistan's governance as well as its economy. Imagine more than 100,000 troops propping up the economy and then in a short period of time, a rapid scaling down of, of the troops. And I would say that it appears that Afghanistan has weathered the worst of it, um, that it has hit bottom perhaps a year and a half ago and the economy is beginning to rebound. And that's good, and it, it reflects some of the important things that the government is doing with regard to uh, the economy, uh, putting into place a PPP law, a national procurement law. The president himself is very much engaged in, in, um, in running the economy, as, as a former World Bank person, economist would do. Um, he also was very much involved uh, with Ambassador Wayne and me uh, in shaping the assistance programs. Um, but let me just contrast um, the assistance program from back then to now. Uh, I would say at that point, there was little government capacity and we were overwhelming the government and the country with, with aid dollars. And so there were a lot of parallel structures. I think what the government has done now is trying to bring in uh, both governments, the U.S. government as well as the Afghan government, bringing more assistance on the books of the government so that it's a coordinated process and the government is, is in the lead. I can say from my experience now, um, I serve as a senior vice president for Creative Associates. We've been involved in basic education uh, in Afghanistan for more than 10 years and we've seen phenomenal progress along the way. But one thing that, do that doesn't 
make it into the headlines is really the capacity of the government uh, in the Ministry of Education and the government actually taking the lead. Mm. Um, so we're often told by, by the government, slow down, we're in charge, we're not ready to move uh, to this district or, or that district, and of course we follow the government. So it's, a, it's an assistance program that is much more aligned with, with the government. Um, I did say that, you know, that, that it does appear that the bottoming out has, has taken place and the economy is on the incline. Uh, but the biggest concern, obviously, is security. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that throughout this session. Um, but when we see the number or percentage of districts under government control declining, um, that is not a good signal to investors. And, and so, um, you know, there are other parts of the world where in, in, a, in an insecure environment we'll see investment come in, but it's not coming in in Afghanistan for, for myriad reasons. But on that, because investment isn't coming in, the economy is growing at a slow pace. And the biggest concern that I have as, as I look at Afghanistan is the demographics. Um, it has the third largest youth bulge in the world. 65% of the population is under the age of 25. Now that could be either the youth curse or the youth dividend. Um, unfortunately, right now it's probably more toward uh, the former rather than the latter. And the problem is the economy is not progressing, is not growing quickly enough to absorb all those who are seeking mm -hmm. jobs. 400,000 new job seekers a year um, are, come out of the university system or the high school system mm. looking for jobs, and the jobs aren't there. And we do know that a lack or the, or the sense of a lack of a future to include a lack of a job um, is one of the reasons um, that, that insecurity is being fueled. Okay. Um, Ramina, unlike you, I'm uh, I'm not an economist. I'm a I'm a political officer by trade, so I'm gonna I'm not gonna go heavy on data. Uh, I'm afraid, uh, but I'm gonna say, in terms of what is different between now and 9/11, and and following on um, Earl's comments, uh, the um, uh, the main difference for us as Americans is obviously that there have been no attacks uh, against our homeland uh, since 9/11. Uh, and I think that in particular what is striking is just as the economy has begun to rebound uh, after the big transition in 2014, uh, it is also the case that the security situation has held steadier than many might have expected. Uh, the fact is that after the end of combat operations, the end of, of 2014, uh, the Taliban and other insurgents threw everything they had uh, at uh, the Afghan government um, and coalition forces uh, and have not been able to actually seize and hold for any period of time any provincial capitals. And the latest uh, numbers from DOD uh, suggest that uh, the government retains control of um, of, of territory that accounts for 21.4 million uh, Afghans, whereas the Taliban is in control of territory uh, that probably holds two to three million um, Afghans. Uh, so, you know, I think there is a bit of a perception in the United States uh, that the Taliban is on the ascendant and that might be true purely in a geographic sense, but what the Taliban is doing is getting uh, great areas of control uh, over deserts and mountains, um, and the cities, uh, the urban centers, continue to uh, be under, under government control, especially the five great cities of uh, Afghanistan. And I think that's important because of another element that was alluded to here, which is the growth of the population. Um, and that population growth has been almost entirely in the cities. Uh, Kabul was a city of 200,000 uh, in 2001. Uh, it is now a city in the millions. I don't think anyone knows exactly how many people. We have four, four, four to five million is the usual is the usual estimate. 
most of those uh, people are young um, and they are connected to the outside world by telecoms in a way that has not happened ever uh, in Afghan history. I mean, Afghanistan is a very different place. It is much more uh, urbanized and for, for notwithstanding its very low level of development is much more connected to the outside world than it ever has been in the past. So I think we need to be thinking about this in terms of the conflict, in terms of a rural traditionalist element versus a urban modernizing element. This is an old conflict. It goes back, um, Tony and I were talking uh, about whether it goes back 40 years or 100 years or longer. Uh, you, could, you could cite Ibn Khaldun if you want to go back to the 11th century uh, on, this, on this phenomenon. Um, but it does seem to me that the weight of demographics is very much on the side of um, what I think all of us in this room would see as progress. So my colleagues have, have uh, laid out many of the achievements and some of the difficulties that we still face along the way. I think it is fair to remember that the reason we went so intensely into Afghanistan were terrorists reaching out of Afghanistan to the United States, and that the reason we are still in Afghanistan and are going to stay has to do with that potential terrorist threat. And if you look at the broader region and Afghanistan and its neighbors, there are still a lot of radicals and terrorism terrorists in that area. And there is a real possibility that if the United States were to precipitously leave, uh, more chaos would return to that space. So then within that context, it's also important to remember that we really didn't understand the scope and complexity of the challenges we were taking on when we went into Afghanistan. And the United States and its allies have been learning along the way They've been working with Afghan partners and allies who've also been learning along the way that are a mix of modernizers and traditionalists, and they're different places on that spectrum. And then in many ways, we've been telescoping the process of building a more modern state and society into a period of time that it would be hard to find another nation where this is, has taken place. So it's not surprising that there are a lot of challenges. And in, in addition to the civil war aspect of this, there's the regional rivalries which continue to complicate the situation in this part of the world. So it's, it's really a, a complex um, set of challenges. As the US government, I think we've learned a lot along the way. As a, a coalition of partners and allies, we've learned a lot along the way, but one, and one of the things we've learned is that if we're going to succeed, there are a number of very important paths of action, lines of action, and those need to be coordinated. They need to be coordinated well. The security actions are really important, but one of the points that we're here to talk about today is that it is also essential that we have a good assistance part of that, which is governance, economic development, related programs, and that we have very effective diplomacy, both inside Afghanistan, with Pakistan, inside Pakistan, in the region, for this all to come together and to move in a positive direction. And that remains a very tough set of challenges. So whatever you think about the policy that the United States just announced, the real focus now is on how well is it going to be implemented? Working with our Afghan partners, um, working with the other countries in the region, trying to find a way to get Pakistan to pl play a more constructive role, to get others as far away as China, which has a very important relationship now with Pakistan, to play a, a more constructive role in moving everybody toward a political settlement. And one of the, the, the key parts of this new strategy is making more explicit, it was already there, it was already a line of action in US policy before, but making more uh, explicit that we are aiming now to move toward a political settlement 
where the Taliban would participate in a peaceful settlement. That's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of these lines of action. And we can talk about that more. But it certainly is my belief that the governance and development assistance part of that, and it's not just the United States, it's all of our, we have many partners and allies investing very helpfully in this area. It's going to be those members of the, the uh, ministries in Kabul who are increasing their effectiveness and their performance and delivering services to the people in Afghanistan. It is going to be the soldiers. Afghan soldiers and others being more effective, but it's also going to be reaching out directly and indirectly to the Taliban and to others and to creating a space where there can be those political discussions. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Um, this, is a, this is a great segue for my next set of, of questions on the future, uh, looking towards the future of, of Afghanistan and and President Trump's recent remarks. Um, what are, uh, for you, the key components of uh, a non-military strategy in Afghanistan? That's my, my first um, broad question. And the second question, um, which Ambassador Wayne um, touched upon, is what is the biggest challenge in implementing these key components? Um, so uh, I invite you to um, answer any of these two questions. Would you like to start? Well, the, the commitment, uh, the new commitment to security is relatively modest. And I guess the theory is uh, by bringing in trainers um, and really focusing on building up the capacity of the Afghan Special Forces, that security uh, in areas where the Taliban uh, are present or where areas uh, that are contested between the government and Daesh and, and the Taliban, uh, that they will be able to to take in uh, take over those, uh, take control of those areas, provide governance, and also provide development in, in those areas. And I would say that you know the U.S. assistance program and other donors assistance programs are primarily working in areas um, where the government has control. And so if, if the government is able to expand its control, then moving into those areas fairly rapidly to provide opportunity, to provide services, will be a priority. Now, I'm not saying that we go back to a, a counterinsurgency approach where stabilization was the primary tool. Um, however, Afghanistan, with the World Bank and other donors, really do have an effective mechanism, and that is through the NSB, through its various iterations, that's the National Solidarity Program, and now has become the Citizens Charter. And, and it's a very robust model. It's operating in, in more than 25,000 uh, 25, um, communities throughout Afghanistan, and it is building at, at a very organic level local governance local governance with development. And so m my view is that that is a, a necessary element almost immediately after security um, has been attained in, in, in new areas. And then other uh, development uh, will come in through education and hopefully at least some market-based um, economic growth, but you know that's a longer term. Okay, so I'm going to be a little bit provocative because uh, I think there's some things from a private sector economic standpoint that need to be uh, really said publicly on Afghanistan that haven't been said for at least the last eight years. Uh, first, we want to compliment President Ghani to continue moving forward on a regional export-led growth, import substitution-based development model. He should be focusing on marble, extractives, gemstones, uh, agriculture, of course, it's 22 percent of the economy, carpets and textiles as well. That's a given. We want them to also continue, though, more aggressively pushing independent power production uh, throughout Afghanistan and linking that production to long-term concessionary agreements that are transparently done under the Extractive Industry Standards Act and focus on coal, gas, and other hydrocarbons. The World Bank made the only exception in the world to do coal development for Afghanistan this year. And that's a big issue. Afghanistan has very good quality, clean burning coal and could supply an enormous amount of their energy requirements around the country. 
Also, we, we need to continue fighting corruption with very high profile cases. If you've been following Afghanistan, they had a four star or a three star general who has been on trial and I believe has been convicted for high level corruption. We need to increase the public financial management of the uh, ministries, especially since, the, according to the World Bank, that only 35% of the budgeted development uh, donor dollars for mission critical infrastructure and economic development projects are getting implemented, are getting spent. That's outrageous. And that's one of the reasons that the parliament itself fired six ministers, I'm sorry, seven ministers this past year as a result of that. So now I'm gonna talk about some things I think quickly that we wanna stop doing and some things that we wanna start doing very quickly. We wanna stop uh, funding endless ministry capacity development projects and start trying to work on building a real market-led economy, private sector economy that can sustain, like Earl said, 400,000 new workers each year, not all of whom are in Afghanistan. A lot of those are refugee returnees that have, when you look at the, uh, the numbers, they actually have, some of them, college educations. They've been working successfully outside the country and are now forced to come back and are getting resettled and have skills that they can be applied to. It is the private sector that is gonna build them, not more government ministry capacity that's going to uh, be a sustainable uh, a plan for them long term. We'd like to see a private sector development plan for 2018 to 2023 that is designed, written, and implemented by the Afghan private sector. There needs to be a bigger voice for the Afghan private sector in the priorities of the government and in the policies and programs that they're implementing. I'll give you one example. I'd like to stop, according to the recent World Bank report, they are now, uh, because of the workout situation that Afghanistan is going through, the bank is advocating that they spend no more money right now on mission critical infrastructure and economic investments because they're bad for growth, according to the bank. The multiplier, this is a term that the bank uses, the multiplier is a negative. Where they would like us to spend more money uh, going forward is on social investments in uh, specifically uh, cash transfers, and some other areas, health and education. They think that multiplier will be more positive. This is at a critical point, I think, pivot point for the country economically. They have to have infrastructure investment in agriculture, irrigation systems, energy, mineral extraction, ICT. That's not gonna get done without the donor community being in sync on this. Next, I think the US government needs to dump the current TIFA. The TIFA is the, basically it's a short bilateral agreement on how we're gonna run our economic relationship <laughs> together. It has not been amended since 2004. It is outdated, it is inappropriate to continue to try to build a bilateral economic relationship between the two countries with an archaic and very weak, frankly, agreement between us. We'd what we'd like to do, and I base some of this based on my observations at the Brussels conference where uh, I was able to sit in on some of these meetings where I was shocked at how even more upset, frankly, than the US government is, our other donors uh, in Europe are upset about Afghanistan. We'd like to see a bilateral economic relationship from here on going forward where the private sector has a part in a TIFA-led economic relationship. There's a council that would form and meet bilaterally when the governments are meeting so that we can better integrate the private sector-led growth strategy longer term with a results framework tied into quarterly benchmarks like the administration is now holding the government accountable for, but with private sector aspects of it more fully integrated. A couple of last points. Uh, I think Jeroya is a uh, government of, of Afghanistan is very focused on the WTO integration and implementation in a session, but I don't want that to take uh, the place of building strong economic relationships with the United States. Right now, uh, there is no bilateral tax, bilateral trade, bilateral investment agreement between the United States and Afghanistan. After 15 years of our blood and treasure, we have none of the basic foundational instruments for economic relations. But we have them with Pakistan, India, and all of the other stands. Basically, we have those agreements already in place, and they've been in place for years. That needs to get fixed. This needs to be a priority of both governments to set up these foundations because no U.S. multinational that might have regional offices in Delhi or in uh, Karachi is gonna come in and invest or allow any of their personnel in if they don't have tax treatment, investment protections, and basic trade protections. And none of that exists right now. Lastly is capital. 
I think capital is, from, from the Afghan American Chamber's perspective, capital is a key issue right now in Afghanistan. There is only 2% of Afghan businesses are using private banks to fund their investments and to invest. All of it is coming out of their pockets or out of other investors from the UAE and Dubai and other places. What we want to see is the Afghan Central Bank loosen its overly conservative lending rules on capital and finance for the business sector. Now, a lot of those rules were put in place after the Kabul bank scandal, but what happens? They went to an extreme now, and now they are offering a higher percentage of, lend of, uh, of earnings for banks to just put their money into the central bank and earn it and not lend that money or capital that is there and available for investment out to businesses that could invest in hotels and uh, marketplaces and light manufacturing facilities or mineral extraction and other things. We'd like to see the bank and USAID, especially their DCA, Development Credit Authority Program, work more, more uh, carefully, maybe OPIC has a role here, using guarantees, blended finance instruments and some other types of tools, first loss risk sharing tools that can help us to get capital flowing again inside the economy. Right now it's not happening and I'll leave it there. Okay. I think um, we were asked to talk a little bit about the future of Afghanistan, as we see it, and um, in the context of, of current U.S. policy. And um, <clears throat> I would just make a couple of observations quickly on, uh, on current policy as enunciated by the President on the 21st of August. Um, first of all, as been widely remarked, it is a, a non-timeline-based approach. Uh, in terms of the military forces, uh, and, uh, and there's a modest increase uh, in our military forces, and of course, as everyone has noted, a harder line uh, with Pakistan, at least publicly. Um, I would say none of these things are actually dramatically new. Um, even the non-timeline-based uh, deployment, the last decision that President Obama made on troops, that is to retain troops at about the 8,400 level, uh, was non-timeline-based. It was conditions-based. That wasn't widely noted at the time, but it is true. Um, and uh, on the increase of troops, I think there's nothing particularly from my perspective, sacrosanct, I haven't been a little bit on, on the margins of the discussions during the Obama administration about the troop levels that were, were there. So all of these things, I think, represent um, a gradual uh, shifting in emphasis um, in U.S. policy rather than a radical um, departure, although it is important uh, that the, you know that the uh, the formal statement of conditions based uh, is policy um, going forward. What is a little bit less clear to me um, is what uh, the U.S. government sees as the overall. Uh, objective, um, the central objective to pursue uh, in, with our engagement in Afghanistan. And it seems to me that what it boils down to is for the U.S. government, there are two broad options for policy going forward. Um, one is a long war. That is where we continue to harden the Afghan state as it has um, uh, developed over the past 16 years, and a lot of the accomplishments have already been highlighted. Um, against insurgents, um, and the other alternative, it seems to me broadly, uh, is to attempt to foster and pursue a political settlement. Uh, again, I look at this in the perspective a political settlement of the conflict. Uh, I look at this in the context of Afghanistan having been in a state of civil war uh, for at least um, the last uh, 40 years. Uh, I also look at it in the context, having been in Pakistan as U.S. ambassador, of the fact that uh, the Taliban uh, has a safe haven in Pakistani territory, and the record of counterinsurgencies uh, against insurgencies that have a foreign safe haven is pretty grim. Uh, so for those reasons, I am a proponent of pursuing a political settlement uh, with uh, the Taliban. And it seems to me that that has to be actually the central objective of U.S. policy. Now, you can read that into uh, the President's remarks uh, of 21st August. He did talk about a possible political settlement at some point in the future. I have yet to meet a four-star general 
um, who doesn't at least privately admit, uh, that is one with Afghan experience, that this is going to end in a political settlement and not in an outright military victory. So it seems to me uh, that if that is indeed the case, we should make political settlement a central element of U.S. Uh, policy, uh, and we should uh, pursue it. Political settlement, to my mind, does not mean that the Taliban is one day going to wake up and sue for peace. Um, I think that's a very unlikely scenario. I don't think the Taliban is winning, uh, but I also don't think they think they are losing. Um, and so there has to be some modality, to use a diplomatic uh, bit of jargon, for the Taliban uh, and uh, the U.S. government uh, and the international community as a whole and regional actors to discuss uh, the issues uh, and a way forward, the issues that divide them. So I think if I were to identify the thing that I see as potentially missing in a fully articulated U.S. policy, and which I hope someone has given some thought to, uh, is the need to bring about some kind of diplomatic process uh, that includes the region uh, and uh, includes um, those who are fighting, at least the Taliban, uh, I don't think Daesh, uh, but those who are the insurgents who have been fighting against uh, the Afghan government, and in some sense, in some ways, uh, and this can be overstretched as a historical analogy, but in some sense represent a group of people that has been uh, fighting uh, for the last 40 years. I think that, uh, as my colleagues' comments have made clear, the challenge is about weaving together lines of action inside Afghanistan and in the region to actually get to a, a positive outcome. Inside Afghanistan, it's, it's exactly right that there are very important things that can helpfully be done in the economy, in governance, and this is going to be a combination of working with the government, but also other political forces in the country. It's really important to remember that relationships between the government and parliament in Afghanistan are not too smooth at the moment. Relationships within the government still need to be uh, smoothed out at times. In that sense, this Kabul compact, the new compact, is going to be an important bilateral mechanism for measuring progress and helping facilitate progress. And it, it needs to do that. It needs to go forward. Even though we're asking a lot of Afghanistan to change and press forward, we need to ask that as part of facilitating a broader settlement. And these things aren't easy. But they're also going to need actors outside the government to participate in this. There are elections that are supposed to be coming up in Afghanistan, parliamentary elections and then presidential elections. And that means there'll be other political forces that need to be dealt with. Not that we should be directing Afghan politics, but we need to understand what's going on in Afghan politics. and. We and our other partners, international partners, can be facilitators and need to talk to the various actors in this process as it goes forward. But I think this compact of these regular meetings between the top senior level Afghan and, and US officials can be very helpful in that process, but not separated from the other donors. This is not just a bilateral uh, deal going on here. It is really important that are, there are these several score other donors working there, that there are about 30 countries that have troops of one sort of another contributing on the military side. This is an important part of what's going on. And those allies and partners are going to be key if we're able to move ahead in this regional process also. They can help facilitate that. They can be supportive of it. Um, so coalition management, as you might call it, or partner management, is a really important line of action going forward. Um, and, and then I think as Rick correctly said, if you look at, if you try to break it down into the actual lines of action, a lot of it is outside of Afghanistan, but working in close coordination with what you're doing in Afghanistan. This is a big set of diplomatic tasks and you could just look at where Rick was ambassador, uh, all the politics and diplomatic maneuvering needed inside Pakistan to get a, a useful dialogue going with Pakistan. There are other tools in this process, but the key is going to be, is there a dialogue that can actually bring us closer together in moving toward a common objective? 
And I do think, as Rick was saying, there is a lot of definition, defining that still needs to go on in where we want to be in several years. And as you notice, the President's policy also talked about the India-Pakistan rivalry and saying this has to be seen in that context. Well, there again is a, a long-standing set of very difficult issues that, yes, it will be great to work and try to reduce that rivalry, but thinking through how you do that how you integrate it into what we're doing in Afghanistan, what we're doing on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, et cetera, a big task. So there's a lot to do here, and it's going to demand a very nuanced and well-coordinated uh, U.S. effort. Thank you. I just have a follow-up question on um, the regional actors. Um, well, how do you see the role of, of China and Russia um, going forward? Um, that's my last question, and then we'll open up um, the last 30 minutes for Q&A for the public. So, so I think also in regional actors, you, you have to, one has to include India as well. And, and I'll talk about India because I think Russia and, uh, and China, um, certainly Russia on the security side is, is a potential negative influencer. And then uh, China more along the lines of investment in Pakistan. And I think that's more suitable for uh, Ambassador Olson. Um, India is, is also an important player. And uh, Ambassador Wells, who is our acting assistant secretary for South Asia, uh, we also think that she she may be the acting SRAP as well doing the negotiations um, in the region. Uh, it was in India very, uh, very recently yesterday, for example. And it's not just um, helping to forge um, security ties and, and, and strengthen diplomatic ties between Afghanistan and, and India, but it's also the economic aspects. And um, India has been uh, a major player in supporting development in, in Afghanistan. They recently inaugurated the, the Freedom Dam, if you will, in Herat province. But it's also to try and, and promote and uh, promote commercial ties. And, uh, and, I, and I know that there is the, a commitment on the part of India to expand, and Afghanistan to expand trade over the next three to four years um, by, f I believe the target is $5 billion. And I know that the U.S. assistance program is, is helping to do that as, as well. That's a main focus. So India, I think, will become an important player, certainly on the commercial side for the U.S. Um, just on the economic side, so uh, from a commercial uh, trade and import-export perspective, Pakistan is still the largest importer of Afghan goods with 39 percent. India is way behind, but catching up now at 9 percent. Uh, China only at 6.1 percent where exports uh, from Afghanistan, uh, uh, commodity trade exports, which includes uh, obviously largely p opium as well, but there's others. There's handwoven carpets, fruits and nuts, wool, cotton. Well, the official numbers that don't include opium show that India is at 43.6 percent and Pakistan at 28 percent. So regionally, their biggest trading partners are, are their next door neighbors. The Chinese have come in and attempted to strike, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, grand bargains on mineral extraction, uh, gas, supplies, rail lines, trying to do a lot economically that will help the Chinese uh, commercial engine, but not necessarily to help the Afghan commercial engine, uh, especially since some of those deals were cut directly with regional governors and not with the central government. And we still have, uh, I think it's right now 70 percent of the real Afghan economy is informal still at this time. So a lot of their trading partners and their major players like China are extracting minerals and resources that are not going through any type of government revenue process or concessionary process, but instead are focused on enhancing uh, the livelihoods of regional governors, power centers, militia leaders, et cetera. Uh so on the regional dimension, I would, I would add a couple of countries to um, the list that we've been talking about. In addition to China and Russia, I think, as has been noted, India uh, and Pakistan are hugely important, uh, and Iran um, is not insignificant. And I think that if we look at, on the political side of things, what we have seen 
is an increase in be hedging strategies um, by almost all of these regional um, uh, players, except maybe, maybe India. Uh, Russia and Iran have been building their relationships um, with uh, the Taliban, uh, despite, uh, let us say, a lack of ideological and religious affinity, especially on the part of Iran. Um, uh, Pakistan has never really uh, uh, abandoned a hedging strategy um, with regard to, um, to Afghanistan. I think what has changed quite a bit from a political standpoint over the past uh, 16 years is that China has become much more engaged in the region. And if there's one piece of sort of positive news in all of this, I think it's that China and the United States largely share um, a common perception with regard to Afghanistan and even to some extent uh, uh, with regard to Pakistan. That is a concern about ungoverned spaces emerging um, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan from which um, uh, attacks on the respective homelands can be, can be made. In the case of China, it's of course the East Turkestan Islamic movement, ETIM, um, which has had uh, safe haven of sorts uh, in uh, the, um, the AFAC border uh, areas. Um, I think that, you know, just to focus for a little bit, for a moment on, on Pakistan in particular, because I think this is a critical question and one that's central to U.S. policy right now. Um, what has not perhaps received as much discussion as it needs to right now is the question of what uh, leverage the United States actually has uh, over, over Pakistan. Uh, there's a considerable emphasis on the assistance that we have provided to Afghanistan, uh, to Pakistan over the past uh, decade and a half, the most recent iteration of which was Kerry Luger Berman, which was about seven and a half billion in civilian assistance, and then substantially more over the years um, in uh, security assistance. But I do think that this uh, pales um, in comparison to what China is putting into Pakistan right now. Um, I wonder the, uh, the Pakistan, uh, pa the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is sort of a piece of the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative. Uh, China is publicly uh, uh, committed to putting 46 billion or 47 billion uh, into Pakistan. Uh, that's in directed investments and uh, soft loans. Uh, I think that from the Pakistani perspective, this greatly reduces the dependence on the United States, on U.S. economic assistance in particular, not necessarily on U.S. security uh, assistance. But the other point that doesn't receive a lot of attention is that, um, and this is just a matter of looking at a map, uh, Afghanistan is a landlocked country. Uh, in Central Asia. Um, if we hope to sustain um, a garrison for some period of time in Afghanistan, we need to access it by land and by air. Um, by land, you really only have the option of going through Pakistan, uh, unless our relations with Iran were to dramatically improve, which I don't think is on the cards. Um, and even uh, by air, uh, the most direct route um, is certainly um, over Pakistan. So uh, I think um, it, it, there is a temptation in Washington to overestimate our degree of leverage uh, on, on Pakistan and Islamabad, uh, and frankly not on Islamabad, on Rawal Pindi. Uh, because of um, our, how we view um, our own substantial assistance programs. Uh, the reality is that I think Pakistan is going to pursue uh, its own self-defined national interests in ways that are probably inimical to ours. And I think, uh, again, we need to address this as a, at a political level. Um, and I think uh, a, the U.S. taking the initiative to launch a, um, a, a political initiative that is a pathway towards a settlement uh, of the conflict uh, is really the only way to address the ultimate uh, question of regional hedging. Uh, I associate myself completely with my colleagues' the statements and Rick's st statement just going on now. Um, we uh, will have to work very hard at establishing this dialogue with Pakistan in a constructive way and having partners 
that are pushing in the same direction, like China, if we can persuade them that this is in their long-term interests, will be very important to getting to a good outcome. And if you think about other conflicts, uh, there have often been friends groups that have helped facilitate that agreement. They can be very helpful. And if you don't have those groups, and if you leave a space, some not-so-friendly friends may go off on their own anyway and try and do things, which can make it much more complicated to get to a peaceful solution. Um, plus the point that there's just a lot of good economic things that can be done for Afghanistan and Pakistan if you can get those cross-Pakistan economic pipelines and transmission lines and other things agreed and working. And the trade, part of the reason, of course, of the trade with India being so low is that Pakistan won't let anything tr cross uh, its landmass to get to India. The Indians would buy a lot more from Afghanistan. So, so that is why it is important to try to work on the India-Pakistan rivalry at the same time. It's just going to be hard to do that. It is important, but hard to do. Um, so all of this leads to the conclusion that, my conclusion, that we need a very active regional policy with the mind, uh, within mind, how do we incentivize a path to a negotiated solution using those other actors that can be useful. None of them, except, I mean, I think Pakistan is the greatest influence on the Taliban, but together there can be a mass there that can make a positive difference if they're organized in a way that helps bring a positive, different, a positive impact about. The big question, one of the big questions is Iran. How are we going to get engaged with Iran and what will they do to uh, mess things up if they don't like what's going on? And we do need to think that through. I still remember back to the first donor conferences that we had in the fall of 2001 and the beginning of 2002 on Afghanistan. Iran was there and they actually wanted to play a constructive role. At that time, for ideological reasons, they were not at all friendly with the Taliban and they were happy to see this change. So there, there, there are still some geostrategic uh, areas where we might be able to find some common ground if we can actually talk to them and, and bring them into a process in some constructive way. Big question mark. I'll end there. Thank you very much. Um, now we have about uh, 25 minutes for um, Q&A from, from the public. So uh, we'll take about two to three questions at a time, uh, we'll answer those and then go to the next round. There are microphones um, at the, yes. So let's take these two, the lady and the gentleman. Can you please identify yourself and your affiliation? Could you please Let's take these two the and then we'll. I'm sorry. Hi, um, I'm Samira Daniels. I'm half Patan and uh, Punjabi and I guess some other uh, ethnic groups. So, um, I'm very interested in the future of Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, and India because uh, according to my father, we were possibly converts from Hinduism <laughs> to Islam. So it's a very complex uh, uh, ethnic uh, background. But I would like uh, uh, Ambassador Wayne and perhaps even Ambassador Olson to, to explain whom you consider the Taliban because uh, I think this question has, has been so convoluted and responsible for the, 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 the chaos that has ensued or should I say the drawbacks to the strategy is, is, uh, is a result of this confusion of the Taliban and the refugees that went over uh, into um, Pakistan after the uh, in the uh, Soviet during the Soviet invasion. Thanks. Uh, my name is Abdul Sana, and I'm a counselor in the Afghan Embassy. My question is also yours, Sarov. Uh, who who are the Taliban? Uh, they have never. Uh, uh, renounced al-Qaeda, they, they are working together with the uh, Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, they are working together with the 
ETIM. They're working with other terrorist organizations, Lashkar e Taiba, Jaish Muhammad, whatever you name them. Uh, so, and, and, and all the insistence has been from some sides that they, uh, that that a political settlement should be sought with the Taliban, but but we don't know. Should we seek a political settlement with the Taliban that is not uh, departing its path from these terrorist organizations that is continuing and insisting on killing the Afghan people? And when it comes to Pakistan, uh, we have always been open to that sincere dialogue with them, but that sincere dialogue never happens because we get the promises and action does not take place. Uh, <coughs> and I think the United States should uh, draw the line with Pakistan. With us or against us is the question that should be asked from them. Because if they continue this getting away with the uh, public statements that they denounce terrorism, they promise they will uh, help uh, take action against the Akhani network and so on, and in the end of the day nothing happens, I think the only way is to uh, focus more also on that military side of uh, the issue and embed it with the political and diplomatic. And, 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 and you, uh, you mentioned that some modalities can be pursued. My question to Ambassador Olsen is, uh, I would love to hear a little explanation on those. Thank you. Uh, you said some modalities um, for this political settlement, yeah. Um, we'll let Ambassador Olson go first because he worked on this directly for <laughs> the last couple of years. Yeah, <laughs> or did you want to go, Tony? No, no, I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, who, who are the Taliban? Uh, well, I, I think that uh, the Taliban is actually uh, a relatively coherent organization. Um, I mean, we can identify who its primary leaders are, um, and we can identify uh, the fact that it has um, uh, several governing bodies, uh, the Quetta Shura, the paramount uh, governing body, and the Peshawar Shura. Uh, both, of course, one would note um, uh, places, city names in Pakistan. Um, and there are a group, uh, uh, the Taliban Political Commission, which has the responsibility for uh, dealing with foreigners and uh, ultimately, presumably, for negotiating with foreigners, uh, does have an informal presence in Doha, uh, Qatar. Um, so, you know, and, and to jump to uh, my colleague's question about modalities, uh, I would say uh, that, uh, you know, the, the first step in a modality, uh, get, that is to say the first step in getting a peace process going, would be to revive what was attempted to be done in 2013, which is to open formally uh, the Taliban office in Doha for the purposes of discussing peace with the Afghan government in a publicly recognized way. Uh, that, is, that is the first step. I think then the second step is to bring in the regional players um, who are so significant, and I think we've identified uh, all of them. There are a lot of challenges there because bringing in, uh, there's a great difficulty, which conceptually I do not know how to reconcile between bringing India and Pakistan into the same room on Afghanistan, and that one is a huge challenge. Uh, so I won't underestimate that. But in principle, it seems to me that that is what one should want to be pursuing um, as a way forward. Now, I fully agree with you that the Taliban uh, has not renounced, um, at least not definitively, has not renounced uh, any ties with Al Qaeda um, or indeed with international uh, terrorist organizations uh, more largely. There are some hints in some various Eid statements that were put out by, you know, by Mullah Omar, or the name of Mullah Omar, I should say, and Mullah Mansour. Uh, but um, there has not been a formal break. Uh, and it's well established. Uh, the Afghan government's position, of course, is that uh, as an end condition, uh, the Taliban will have to renounce terrorism, break with Al Qaeda, they'll have to put, stop violence, um, and respect the Afghan constitution. 
Uh, it's important to note that those are end conditions, um, and that has been, at least under the Obama administration, that was also the policy of, of the United States, to have those as end conditions. But I think it's unrealistic to expect that what are perceived by the Taliban as concessions are unlikely to be made at the outset of a process. I think they will come at the end of a process. Um, and I think that the principal Taliban demand, at least for the United States, um, is the withdrawal of foreign forces. And I think it's equally unrealistic to expect the United States to concede that point early in a process. But it seems to me between, there is a space there for diplomatic negotiation and for discussion. Um, and uh, I think that the only way we'll be able to actually find out whether a deal is possible is if we get into that negotiating space and begin to um, talk about these core issues. So just to add, I think uh, it's exactly right. There are different parts of the Taliban, there's no question. But they do have unifying political bodies that come together to talk about it. They argue among themselves. They have differences of opinion. There's difference between the local Taliban who go out and fight in one province and the people living in Pakistan. That, that's true. But it's true in a lot of insurgencies around the world. Um, and it takes often just a long process to start engaging, defining what they really want, what the, what the government really wants, and finding a common ground. Um, and that you, you just need to engage and keep trying. And there'll be a lot of failed efforts in doing that. But you try to create the conditions so that gradually the perception of the benefit of a political settlement become more positive. And you could see this in other, look how long in Colombia it took to get to a position of a political settlement. Many, many years of difficult fighting from, from both parties and difficult negotiations and a lot of failed starts and then even a good process that got turned off for a while, they got turned back on again. And then a referendum that by the people causing it to be revisited again. So if you look at all these places, it, it's, it's really, it's a hard process, but you've got to start. Certainly from the US perspective, the groups that uh, attack specifically US persons, civilians and others are the least acceptable of those interlocutors. And that will be part of the discussion during the negotiations, those who use terrorism. But as Rick said, that's going to be part of the initial discussion, and hopefully you'll get to a, a common solution. And I'm sure that's the same from the point of view of the Afghan government also. So this is going to be tough, but if we don't try this path, it's unlikely, I think as Rick also said earlier, to find a solution where there's been a sanctuary, an active sanctuary, is, is really hard to find. Can I, can I Just one point on the, on the coherence of the Taliban I meant to mention. The fact is, we have done a deal with the Taliban, uh, whatever one thinks of it, the release of Bo Bergdahl, uh, who was held by the Haqqanis, that is the least acceptable element of uh, the Taliban, uh, was, uh, he was released um, in response to negotiations with the political commission, which is to say the representative of the Quetta Shura. So it does suggest that it is, in fact, there is a degree of coherence in the organization. Um, I'll take two questions from the left, and then I'll take two questions from the right. Uh, the <laughs> I already did. <laughs> uh, the lady in blue, uh, at, and then the gentleman here at the... In the front row. Thanks very much. I'm Megan Wong with the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. Thanks so much for this wide-ranging discussion that hasn't focused only on the military aspect, but also on the uh, development and, and other aid aspects. One topic that has been conspicuously absent from conversations around the August 21st policy is women's role in the self-reliance, conflict resolution, and security of Afghanistan. As more than half of the population is women, um, how can the new policy effectively incorporate the educational achievements that were talked about, the economic advancements, and the leadership of women in Afghanistan's future, while still avoiding backsliding in violence against women, their economic opportunities, and their participation in the ongoing peace process. Thanks so much. I, I 
can take maybe right. the economic. Oh. 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 Thank you very much. Excellent discussion. Alexander Kravitz from Insight. Just a quick comment on, uh, since Ambassador Wayne mentioned Colombia, and maybe uh, I'm, I'm going to be an optimist here, but one thing to think about, very much getting ahead of myself, is uh, accompanying the implementation of an eventual peace agreement. Because even in Colombia today, you know, I mean, the, the actual implementation, it's not like you signed a deal and we're done, and, or, or Central America, et cetera. That's just a quick comment. But two questions for um, Ambassador Olson. One is maybe moving beyond the modalities. I wonder if, if you could, not to put you on the spot, but to put you on the spot, maybe speculate on what the broad outlines of a deal would, could look like, you know, between the, the, the Taliban and the government. And, um, and, and in terms of leverage with, uh, with, uh, with Pakistan, I'm, I'm wondering if you could comment on, on the importance of trade between um, uh, uh, Pakistan and, and the U.S., how that, if, is that a source of leverage or, or not? Thank you. Uh, sure. My wife so, is listening. <laughs> uh, l let me say that the Constitution of uh, Afghanistan protects uh, the rights of women, and I, I believe that the administration, uh, President Ghani, very, very serious about women's rights, um, education for women, uh, employment opportunities for, for women. Um, unfortunately, as they have been disadvantaged over, over years, um, their, their own development is, is quite limited in, in terms of comparison with men. By that I mean if you look at, at, at things such as illiteracy rates, double what it is of, of men. However, I know that the donors, I know that USAID, its largest program is focused on women's empowerment and trying to build the quality uh, and skills of women so that they become leaders in the parliament, they become leaders in schools, they become leaders uh, in, uh, in the economy. A couple of ideas on that. So um, uh, support to Afghan women, both within the economy, but also within the institutions of governance in Afghanistan, has been a critical part of U.S. assistance for over 11, 12 years. So that money was put into our budgets to fund not only USAID, but other activities, whether it be through the bank, through Afghan ministries, through direct on budget support, and so forth. That money has been there and is still there. This administration has now had two basic budgets that they can influence, and that money is still there. The new budget that came out yesterday by SACFO, the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on State and Foreign Ops, has maintain, maintenance of the Afghanistan budgets to a large degree, and it's likely the House uh, conference with the Senate will continue those. And I think, you know, there hasn't been any major announcement or even an intimation that the, that the administration is going to pull back from that. And I, I, I rest that also on the fact that Dina Powell, who's one of the president's closest advisors, is a very strong supporter. When she was at Goldman Sachs, she ran one of the largest NGO organizations supporting women globally, but Afghanistan was a big focus for Dina in a lot of the activities that she worked on. And I know that she's a big voice inside the National Security Council about maintaining this kind of support longer term. Um, on the issue of vocational training, so uh, when the United States went in, we saw a primary focus on health care implementation, not through men, but through women. And those women, whether they be midwives or doctors or others, are basically the capacity of the health ministry, and they have been the ones who implemented the vaccination programs all over Afghanistan that have taken their child death and maternal death rates down to record numbers. It is women who have done that. On the ICT sector, I, I like to re re remind everybody about this. Cell phone penetration in Afghanistan now is over 92%. That means a large portion of women have cell phones. Now, what that means operationally on the ground to an Afghan woman in a family in a rural village, she can get the call from the midwife that she's coming in to do vaccinations in the village and to do health checkups and have her, have her children there as opposed to before, she'd have to get on a horse or in, in a, a ride on a bus and go four, five, six hours to get health care. That has changed now. ICT has helped that. So it's not just that they have cell phones, it's that it's opening a door for women in Afghanistan to have access to a whole bunch of other services. And I hope we continue our support for it longer term. 
quick word on women. Um, it, before, I, I gave a compressed version of what has been Afghan and U.S. policy on reconciliation. Um, the full third end condition is respect for the Afghan constitution, including its provisions with regard to minorities and women. And I think that's hugely important, and I think it will be uh, a topic that I would envision would have to be an important part of any uh, political settlement. And I think that uh, once one got a modality underway, whatever form it takes, uh, there would have to be a, a very serious discussion of women's issues, and I think it would be, uh, I suspect, uh, that uh, President Ghani and the, the National Unity Government would want uh, a strong women's representative uh, component in any discussions that took place. And I think that certainly the, the gains of the past 16 years have to be preserved. So then I guess that heads us into what's the, what are the outlines of the formula and what is, what is the deal that could be worked. Um, and look, this is very speculative. I don't think it'll be possible to say until the negotiations actually um, begin, but it seems to me I would, I would break the sets of issues down into sort of into three, three buckets, right? You have the purely internal domestic Afghan issues, that is the issues that have driven a civil war over the course of the last 40 years. Um, you have the regional dimension, uh, that is the interference of regional powers. And then you have the question of at least how the Taliban would define it of the foreign forces, which is to say um, our presence um, through NATO um, over the past uh, 16 years. If I were working on this, what I would be looking to do is to get um, some uh, assurances and more than assurances, actual evidence of breaking of links between, um, between uh, the Taliban uh, and al-Qaeda um, and other terrorist groups. And in return for those um, uh, breakages, uh, begin to think about some kind of phased withdrawal uh, of, of foreign forces. But obviously the devil is in the details on this and you'd have to make sure that there's something enforceable and reversible if the you know, assurances don't turn um, into uh, a reality. Um, the um, external element, again, it's, it's simpler to state in principle than it probably would be to uh, negotiate in process, but the basic idea is that Afghan territory cannot be a threat um, to anyone um, in the region, cannot be used against anyone else. Uh, and um, there are, of course, we've talked, I've talked about the safe havens um, on the Pakistani side of the border. But of course, Pakistanis, if there were a Pakistani representative here, he would say that there are um, uh, safe havens on the Afghan side of the border for the TTP and Daesh. Uh, so those issues need to be addressed. Um, and uh, uh, then finally, there are the internal set of issues uh, and I think that these have to be addressed, obviously, this is when we talk about an Afghan-led, Afghan-owned peace process, this is really the core issue that has to be Afghan-led and Afghan-owned, and really in which foreigners, I don't think, are going to have very much to say except, you know, perhaps to set some broad boundaries on what they can find acceptable and sign up to or not sign up to. But I think there is going to be, have to be some discussion uh, amongst, between the Taliban uh, and the Afghan government of um, the constitution, whether it needs to be amended, um, and perhaps um, how the Taliban can, on the model of the FARC, come into the Afghan political process in a peaceful uh, way. And I don't think we can prejudge that except to say that, of course, Afghans do have some very ready-made institutions for addressing these questions. I mean, um, Afghan politics at some level is all about reconciliation, and if you, uh, and I would see this developing through a lawyer jirga. Um, and so it's not hard to imagine in principle how this could be uh, brought about. The final thing that I would say um, on this, uh, there, we shouldn't underestimate the emergence of Daesh, of, of Islamic State in um, Afghanistan as a new factor uh, that changes the dynamic somewhat. 
Uh, it is not, and I'm speaking, you know, obviously in a speculative way, it is not out of the realm of the possible that that, that has changed the Taliban's calculation on foreign forces, and that's something to be discussed. Um, I don't think it's out of the realm of the possible the Taliban might accept some you know, gradual phased withdrawal over a very long period if that would help to assure Afghan stability and prevent um, a conflict and contain conflict with Daesh. Oh, yeah, uh, leverage on Pakistan. Uh, well, look, I, I don't, I, it's true that, that Pakistan and the, U, uh, and the U.S. Have, uh, the U.S. has been Pakistan's largest trading partner um, over the years. Um, I don't know if that's still true. I haven't looked at the, the numbers recently, and I suspect in, in this regard, as in others, China is probably uh, moving, uh, moving ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much, uh, I don't think it offers much leverage in a negative sense. Um, I don't think there is anything that we would want to do to reduce our exports uh, to Pakistan. We don't import much uh, from Pakistan. In a positive sense, of course, uh, there is um, a huge uh, potential incentive for Pakistan. Uh, in that it's a textile producing country and if it were able to import its textiles into the United States under more favorable terms, um, that would be a big boon uh, to the Pakistani economy. But, you know, I, I, frankly, my sense is uh, first that no one is really thinking about carrots right now. Uh, and uh, second, trade deals in and of themselves, well, I leave it to the collective, you know, sense of the audience whether this administration is going to pursue trade deals, you know, um, uh, and especially free trade deals. So um, I potentially, you know, it's interesting, but I, I don't see it as something that has a real um, uh, immediate opportunity. Just to be very quick, uh, two things. One, I do think the frontier between Afghanistan and Pakistan and enhancing security there can be part of a confidence building and trust building process and should be mm -hmm. if we're able to move this forward because there are people operating on both sides of the border against the other country. Uh, secondly, I, I do think, of course, the, I mean, the women's issue is very important and it's important that people keep uh, making sure that that's brought up and considered as things go, as things go forward. Uh, but I think there will be a lot of voices from uh, the United States, of course, supporting that in that we have all dedicated a lot of time and effort to helping the role of women in Afghanistan expand. Thank you. Just one final question from the right. Um, I just have a comment. Uh, my name is Azimi. I have been working in Afghanistan for the last 14 years, all outside the wire. For those of you who have been in Afghanistan, you, mean, you understand what I mean when I say outside the wire. I, I have witnessed our successes and failures in Afghanistan. I think that there are three major successes that we have accomplished over the years. First was the political structure in Afghanistan. Nobody has it in that area. Second is the laws and constitution. It's well advanced and nobody has in that area in that region. Third, a free press that I would say nobody has in that area. Our failures, economy, okay. Specifically, employment or unemployment. Today, if you want to be employed in Afghanistan, you have only one industry to go to, and it's called the war industry. Either you get hired by Taliban or by, you, by the Afghan army. Either way, you're dead six months later. Taliban pays $400 or $500, and Afghan army pays 200 to 250. That's the sad story in Afghanistan. But anyway, the even the greater problem is that everything in Afghanistan is being resolved by politics. And I hear that with you guys. Here is the issue with Afghanistan. You have, let's suppose somebody needs an, uh, has an appendectomy. He needs a surgeon. But the very first thing that happens, they will go to foreign ministry in Afghanistan, the American embassy, the Italian embassy, they all get together in order to get a surgeon to give the person a surgery. That's the issue in Afghanistan. Nobody has defined the, the uh, 
the problem, the actual problems in Afghanistan. And finally, I don't want to take much of your time, and that is we have to remember, we have to go back for those of us who have been around for a, a bit longer, that what candidate Bill Clinton said in 1989, it's economy, stupid, it's economy. That's the whole issue of Afghanistan. That's it. Okay, thank you. Are there any final comments? Uh, I, I, would, I would agree with your premise. I think I don't want it to be just the economy. I, I think when you say the economy to President Ghani, he thinks the government economy. Uh, when he says it to me, when you say it to me, I want it to be a private sector market-led economy in Afghanistan because I think that's the only way to build sustainable growth. They can't continue at 2% growth. In order to absorb the workload, the workers coming in, they need to be growing at 6 to 8% per year. And they're not going to hit that without the private sector being the economic engine of Afghanistan. So everybody should focus on the private sector solutions. And I would even posit that if you want to have progress with the Taliban, you need to talk about economic diplomacy and jobs and how they can get integrated into a formal economy. That's not going to happen unless there's a private sector there to hire people and to train farmers not to grow poppy. I'll just end and say that, that certainly the objective of, of the government and, and the donors is the right objective, private sector-led growth, and looking at least in this interim period over the next few years, targeting high-value exports uh, into the region. The real question is, is the strategy right? and are the implementing mechanisms the right ones to achieve that? And, and that's obviously something that needs to be, uh, to be analyzed and discussed further. Yeah, I, I would say uh, at the end of the day, of course, there's no question that um, economic issues are ultimately what will determine uh, the success of, um, of Afghanistan. Uh, but I think it's a question of sequencing, and uh, you know the experience I've had and much of uh, the developing world over a 35-year career uh, is that um, if you have a political compact and then have economic development, it works better if you try, than if you try to uh, foster economic development without a political compact. So just to add on that final process, that we do have a framework and process agreed for reviewing what progress is being made or not made in uh, the economic area and the governance area. The problem is making it actually work and have teeth and produce results, and we haven't been so good in doing that. So uh, if we can do that over the next year or two, in addition to working in these other areas, I think we can hopefully see some good progress. Well, thank you for uh, our panelists and the rich discussion we had today and for all of you um, for being here and your questions. And this concludes the, the session.